Okay, so this is the start of Lecture 4. I didn't realise when we finished last week that uh, that was the end of the hydro turbine side. We will be coming back uh, to look at hydro turbines in the context of storage, <clears throat> excuse me, because uh, what is called pump storage hydro, the use of hydro's uh, schemes to uh, provide uh, energy storage is an important example of it, and we'll be looking at that later. But we're moving on to wind energy, and the fr first slide of the section on wind energy shows some of the diversity of the technology. Um, so in the bottom left-hand side, we have a, a windmill that was um, built, I think it was a, around 1500. This is an English uh, windmill. And you can see the, um, I'm not sure what this is called behind the, the windmill, but that was a lever that the miller, the person who owned the windmill and, and uh, turned the wheat into flour uh, by grinding it, uh, the miller had to turn the windmill into the, into the wind with this lever. And this is an, an example of what's called a post mill, uh, which was one, the most common type of windmill in England in the 16th, 17th century. I put it in there just to indicate that wind energy has a very long history. And we're going to be looking a little bit at, at other features of the history later on. Um, the one in the middle, uh, this is a photograph I took in Kenya, in Africa. Um, I was visiting a friend of mine who owns a company that makes uh, these water pumping windmills. So this windmill with lots of blades, low speed, is designed to pump water out of the ground uh, to irrigate irrigate crops and things like that. I don't know whether you have them in Russia, but they they used to be extremely common in North America and Australia and countries like that. And even in Canada nowadays, if you drive out of the city into the prairies, into the countryside, uh, you see quite a few of these windmills still. Uh, on the top left is an example of a small, another example of small uh, wind turbines in this case. This turbine here, you can see, is uh, mounted on a communications tower. And this uh, wind turbine, which is about, about one metre in diameter, so further apart uh, in my hands than I can show on the screen, uh, produces something like 200 watts, uh, which is not a lot of power, but considering that communication systems can be in very remote parts of the country. This, uh, this photograph is from Australia um, and the situation would be similar in Russia. Uh, um, communication systems like this don't need a lot of power, uh, but it's difficult to, say, have a, have a petrol or a diesel generator because you have to keep coming to the communication system to, to refuel it. So this one has a wind turbine and it has a photovoltaic uh, module as well and a small battery for energy storage. Um, and this is actually quite a recent photograph. This is about a year and a half old, and this is a pro probably a big area for the application of small-scale wind. If we go down to the bottom right, um, you can see wind turbines that you are probably uh, the type of wind turbines that you would think of if someone says, what does a wind turbine look like? This is, this is a photograph from southern Alberta. Uh, these are two megawatt uh, wind turbines. The blades are about 40 metres long and the tower is about, 40, is about 80 metres high. And these are horizontal axis turbines. In other words, the axis of rotation is horizontal. They have three blades and the blades are upwind of the tower. In other words, um, the wind direction is towards the turbine as we're looking at the turbine there. Um, and that is the standard arrangement of large modern wind turbines. Virtually every large wind turbine that is manufactured nowadays is this type of turbine here. And often it's very difficult to tell the manufacturer of the turbine just by looking at the turbine. 
I happen to know this is a General Electric turbine, an American company, but uh, it's often very difficult to distinguish between the different manufacturers because of the commonality of the technology. It's a little bit like uh, the difference between the Boeing Dreamliner, the 787, and the Airbus uh, A350. They're very similar aircraft. They both have two engines. They have some form of wingtip uh, modification, and you have to look carefully at them to be able to tell one from the other. That's certainly the, the situation for large wind turbines. And I'm saying quite a bit about that because I would like you to think uh, to consider what is the reason for that. Why has the technology of large-scale wind turbines converged on this when you can see on the left-hand side of the slide a range of very different uh, technologies? And we're going to be talking a little bit about that as we go through uh, this section on wind energy because it's got a lot to do with the reasons why wind energy is very cheap. Okay, one of the main point or one of the important points that I want to get across to you in this section on wind energy and also when we get on to photovoltaics is that the reason that these renewable energy technologies are so cheap is that they are mass produced. Okay, it, it is the cheapness or the reduction in price of the manufacturing that has really led uh, to the reduction in cost. So what's happened to diversity and what's, what's happened to other forms of wind energy? And here's, here's a very interesting example. Uh, this, is, this is a photograph of uh, the RISO site. And RISO is outside of Copenhagen in Denmark. Uh, it is a very famous uh, wind energy laboratory that was started in about, about 50 years ago and is now associated with the Danish Technological University. And they do uh, wind turbine testing. You can see there's a, there's a standard type of wind turbine. Here's a wind turbine here. And here you see uh, a what's called a multi-rotor turbine that was built by the company Vestas. And Vestas is the largest manufacturer of large wind turbines in the world. They installed this multi-rotor so one, two, three, four rotors on the same tower. And this is a, a quote from the senior vice president of Vestas about why they did that. And I'd like you to think about the, what he meant by that, uh, how it actually occurs in practice, and whether it was just a public relations statement. Because uh, as far as I know, there hasn't been any commercialization of the of these multi-rotor uh, technologies. You can think of advantages and disadvantages of these technologies. And if anyone is interested in it, I would be happy to discuss it either in the chat or offline later. But I want to I want to get back to the issue of what's happening with uh, large-scale wind turbines, the ones that we recognize with three blades and a tubular tower and this slide here basically tells you probably something that you already know when turbines are getting larger and does anybody know what the driver for the increasing size of wind turbines is uh what do you mean like efficiency that efficiency grows with the size Why? um that that could be a reason. I think you're, that it, that is generally true that efficiencies are increasing with size, um, but that may not have a lot to do with the size. It might just be the uh, development of the technology. So, for example, uh, better airfoil sections for the blades and things like that. Now, the real the real driver, the real reason that wind turbines are getting larger. Uh, you can see from this from this image here, uh, it's offshore wind turbines. So this this is the ocean, and what's happening in Western Europe is for a whole uh, range of reasons. There are very few sites left for turbines on shore on land. So wind turbines are, are being placed in the ocean. 
Um, so Germany, the Netherlands and England or the United Kingdom are the main countries that are developing offshore wind turbines. I mentioned this briefly in the introductory lecture on wind turbines, and you can see here uh, we're comparing the wingspan of an Airbus A380, which is the largest commercial aircraft in the world, to a wind turbine blade. And as far as I know, the largest uh, wind turbine blade currently being made is over 100 metres, so even larger than what is implied here. And the reason is offshore wind, that when you move your wind turbines offshore, the installation and the maintenance costs rise dramatically as a, as a fraction of the cost total cost of the project. So if you're wanting to generate 100 megawatts of, of wind offshore, then it's cost effective to do that with 10 10 megawatt turbines and say 50 2 megawatt wind turbines because the cost of mounting the turbines in the ocean, the cost of maintenance goes up significantly. So the big driver, the virtually the whole reason for this upward trend in wind, in wind turbine size is the offshore wind market. Uh, if you're building an onshore, a, a land-based wind farm, then at the moment you don't use turbines this large. Um, there's, there's three large wind farm projects in southern Alberta near where I live underway at the moment, and they're, they're using turbines that are probably about half the rated uh, power capacity of the one that you see here. So... Uh, it's worthwhile to remember that that driver, what is making wind turbines larger, is a, a very, very strong market offshore. Okay, before we get on to looking at how wind turbines um, behave and, and um, perform, um, I want to go back to a slide that I showed you in the first lecture um, just to give you some uh, terminology, the names that we're going to use. So there is a blade. For a wind turbine, there is a hub, uh, here is a tower, and the tower top is called the nacelle. And if we talk about the blades together, we talk about the rotor. Okay, so when I say the wind turbine rotor, I mean in this case the three blades that make up uh, that wind turbine. If we have a look inside the nacelle, uh, on the left, you can just see uh, the blades. Uh, they come in through a thrust bearing. So this bearing here, which is mounted to uh, the frame that's holding the turbine, that absorbs all the horizontal force that acts on the blades. That force can be very large and uh, it doesn't come into the power extraction aspects of the turbine directly, but it's a very important force dynamically and for a lot of other reasons. Because you imagine we have a, a, a force acting horizontally on the nacelle from the blades at the top of the tower, and if we have 100 metre long blades, then the tower is probably 140 metres high. So a force that is measured in meganewtons acting horizontally at that height has a big impact on the structural dynamics of the tower and also on the foundation design. Okay, so the thrust on the tower, on the blades, even though it's not aerodynamically important, is very important structurally. So that thrust bearing there absorbs the load that is coming in from the blades. Then there's a main shaft and often a gearbox, not always, but often a gearbox. And unfortunately, not clearly shown in this image here is sort of below where the laser pointer is, is the generator. And the other thing I want to draw your attention to is these blue components here. These are your drives. Your is the uh, rotation of the nacelle about the tower axis. And these your drives are there so that the turbine can be turned into the wind. 
okay? If you look at the basic aerodynamics, uh, you see very uh, clearly that the maximum power that's produced by a horizontal axis wind turbine occurs when the rotor is facing the wind. And if you look at a large wind turbine, it's not clear on this photo here, but on top of the nacelle, there will be an anemometer and a wind vane. And that anemometer and wind vane uh, give you the wind speed and the wind direction. And if the rotor is not facing the wind, then these your drive units are activated. You can you can see the pinion gear down below here. Uh, they that is engaged by the yaw drive, and that yaws the turbine round into the wind. So they're the main components that you get up on top of the wind turbine. Um, there are basically two main uh, uh, nacelle layouts. There is what I've shown here, which is dominated by the gearbox. Okay, here's the gearbox here. Uh, this arrangement here uh, doesn't have a gearbox because number three is a direct drive generator, often a permanent magnet generator, but a generator that does not need a gearbox. And these two images are just different views or different representations of that layout. The top one is a lot clearer than this one, but this one has the numbers on it, so I've included both. Um, these direct direct drive turbines tend to have a bigger nacelle than the ones we saw previously because the typical size of this annular generator is significantly greater than the size of the generator in the previous uh, image. Um, so the nacelles are larger, the, the tower top weight is greater, but they have the big advantage of having no gearbox. Okay, and that is a huge advantage because um, uh, the wind industry uh, probably started in uh, earnest or really started developing in the 1980s and all the accumulated operational experience of the wind industry since then has shown that, generally speaking, the gearbox uh, is the most vulnerable component of the wind turbine. It is a component that requires the most, most maintenance. And you can imagine that if you have a problem or you have to replace a gearbox that looks like this, that is sitting on top of a tower, then you need to bring a crane to the wind turbine site to make that change. And even just bringing a crane to a wind farm to lift the generator out of the nacelle, that can be extremely expensive. And it gets worse when you go offshore. Okay, I mentioned before that installation and maintenance costs for offshore wind turbines are higher as a fraction of the total project budget. And so virtually all offshore wind turbines are of this arrangement here, a direct drive generator with no gearbox. At the moment, the, the onshore turbines are roughly evenly split between uh, gearboxes and no gearbox uh, arrangements. Okay, so this is a photograph of this uh, turbine here, and you can, you can see or you can imagine that it has a large generator in the nacelle because the nacelle is rather large. And on the left, I just point out a couple of uh, important things about the tower. Um, the tower doesn't concern us directly because it's not involved with the energy extraction, but it is important because it holds the turbine in place and it transmits the turbine loads to the ground to the foundation. And interestingly enough, the most difficult part of a tower to design is this doorway at the bottom. You can probably just see it in this photograph here down the bottom. There's an entry door to the bottom of the wind turbine tower. Um, designing the tower with that door in it is usually quite a challenge because the worst case uh, situation for that door is when the wind is blowing from the other side of the tower which means that the thrust on the tower is, is going to try and cause 
this opening or this area of the tower to buckle. And designing the tower to prevent buckling under compressive loading is, is often the most uh, difficult part of the tower design. From our perspective, in order to uh, learn a little bit more about the layout of the, uh, wind turbines, you can see here that we have um, uh, a view of the power electronics. So the first part of the power electronics is often up in the nacelle with the other components. But then the inverter and the transformer and filter for grid connection, that is always at the bottom of the tower. Uh, for two reasons. One is to minimise the weight on the nacelle and the other is that there are some control features associated with this power electronics at the base of the tower. Okay, all wind farms will have a central control uh, area, but uh, if there's a problem there or if the maintenance people are on site and they want to do some maintenance on, a, on a one wind turbine, you see, just talk a little bit about some of the, the difficulties that you have with long wind turbine blades. And this photograph up the top here is one of my favourites. Here is a truck that is taking a wind turbine blade to a site. Uh, obviously, the truck went around the corner and the wind turbine didn't, the blade didn't. Um, I showed this, I showed this uh, image to a class in Calgary recently and one of the students said to me, why don't they make wind turbine blades in segments and join them when you get to the wind, to the wind farm? You know, why, why make the whole blade in the factory? Why not make it in two halves and join the halves at the wind farm? That's a, that's a fantastic question. And the answer is that at the moment we don't have the technology to do it because the joint uh, that would have to be made would have to withstand loads that wind turbine engineers at the moment are not happy to put onto, say, a segmented uh, blade. But there's a lot of research and development going on around the world uh, to actually make blades in segments because I think this blade here is probably about uh, 60 or 70 metres long. You know, the longer and longer blades get and the wider and wider they get, the more difficulty or the harder it is going to be to get them to site. So that, that's that's certainly an issue that come, that is coming up. In fact, um, this blade here, the one that we have at the university, we got that for free because it fell off the back of a truck. It, 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 had, a, it had an accident very similar to, to this uh, blade here, and that's how we got it. Okay, blades have a very tough life. They, they, uh, the tip of a wind turbine blade can be moving at 90 metres per second. Um, there can be ice. Uh, which is an issue for Canada and Russia. Uh, there can be lightning damage, as I mentioned, and this is very likely the outcome of lightning damage here. More importantly, uh, raindrops become a source of erosion. So erosion by rain is an important issue uh, with wind turbines uh, currently. I know of wind turbines, the blades that have to be repaired after even two or three years because they get significant erosion from raindrops hit, hitting the blade uh, near the leading edge. I've mentioned this problem before, the issue of the non-sustainability of turbine blades. Um, I talked about that in the introductory lecture, so I won't say anything more about that. Um, what I'll point to now is a slide that I'll probably take about 10 minutes to go through, because this slide shows most of the things that we need to learn from this section of a wind of on wind energy because what we're trying to do or what I'm trying to teach you is how to how the wind turbine basically performs and what that means in terms of the generation of electricity. Um, so what I'm going to do is to go through 
the specifications that are listed here uh, for this particular wind turbine. I'm not. There's no no special reason that I've chosen this wind turbine. It's just an, an example. Um, it's a Vestas turbine, and the designation here, the 164, that tells us the diameter of the of the rotor in meters. Okay, so that means that the blade is 80 meters long. So it's it's very close to the largest commercial wind turbine. It's designed primarily for offshore applications. And one of the things that we're going to spend a lot of time uh, just working out is uh, how, why does the power curve look this way? The power curve is a plot of power output here versus wind speed. And we're going to be looking at the features of the power curve, why it has that shape, how the controller is used uh, to get that power curve, and then from that power curve, how we get the annual energy production. So AEP, the annual energy production, is a critical uh, factor or feature of wind turbine operation. It's, if you think about it, it's equivalent to the capacity factor. In the first lecture, I mentioned the capacity factor as the ratio of the average power output divided by the rated power. The annual energy production is just another way of telling that. If you go to a manufacturer's website, you will get uh, information on the power curve and the annual energy production. They're the fundamental uh, quantities that you need to know. So uh, what I'm going to do now is to go down through the specifications that are shown here. So first of all, we see the rated power of the turbine. The rated power is the maximum power that that turbine produces. So here is the rated power. Whenever you hear a turbine size given in megawatts, that is the rated power. So a two megawatt wind turbine will produce two megawatts maximum power. Okay, then we talk then we talk about the cut in wind speed. That is the lowest wind speed at which power is produced. So if you look down here at the power curve, the power curve rises from zero at four meters per second. Then we have the operational rotor speed. And you can see that rotor that rotor speeds are very low for large wind turbines, between 4.8 and 12.1. Um, uh, uh, revs per minute. And I'm just trying to uh, move, oh, yeah, I, can, I can move the, the Zoom uh, information that I'm screen sharing. So uh, this rotor will operate between 4.8 and 12.1 um, <clears throat> revolutions per minute. Quite slow when you think about it, but you might also like to think about why they're so slow. Then we have a nominal rotor speed, 10.5 meters per second. Uh, temperature ranges, and you can see that the minimum temperature is significantly higher than what we get in Canada and you very likely get in Siberia. Uh, if you're going to operate a wind turbine in a cold climate, uh, there are special features that you have to include in the design. And there's a lot of research and development that has gone into adapting wind turbines, particularly for cold climates. It's mainly to do with things like the strength of the steel that is used to make the tower. The composites in the blades are usually okay at low temperature, but you can also have problems with the lubrication of the gearbox and things like that. So that's... That's why the, the temperature range has to be um, specified. Uh, the wind class, I'm not going to tell you about that because that is really extra information that doesn't uh, really help us too much. Um, I will just point out that IEC that you see here, that stands for the International Electrotechnical Commission. And the International Electrotechnical Commission is a main international organization that produces standards for wind turbines. 
Uh, the, this turbine is designed for an average annual wind speed of 11 metres per second. Given that the tower height is probably 120, 130 uh, metres, that's not unusual. One of the, and also one of the reasons why offshore wind is attractive is that average wind speeds offshore are usually higher than the wind speeds onshore. So this would, this would be a very high uh, average wind speed for a smaller onshore turbine, but not so much for a uh, offshore turbine. Um, this information here about the wireball shape and scale parameters, that's to do with the probability distribution of the wind speed. Um, because the way in which you determine how a wind turbine with a power curve like that will produce a particular uh, annual energy production as shown here really depends on what the probability distribution of the wind speed at the site is. So this, this curve here, the power curve, is specific to the wind turbine the annual energy production is an interaction between the power curve and the site conditions. And so this power curve here would have been generated for these particular values of the parameter that you see here. The Weibull probability distribution is widely used for wind speed uh, 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 measurements and wind resource assessments. And I'm going to show you an example. I'll show you later what a viable probability distribution looks like, and we can see how it produces an annual energy production. Um, the turbulence intensity, uh, that it tells us how, how much fluctuating energy there is in the wind. Um, the turbulence intensity is important because it uh, factors into the fatigue loads of the blades and the other components. And similarly, when we look at these wind speeds here, um, we see um, both a 10-minute average and a three-second gust value for the extreme wind speeds. So these wind speeds here, according to the IEC standard, are the wind speeds that have to be used to uh, design the turbine for safe operation. So a turbine would have to uh, be able to withstand a three-second gust wind speed of 70 metres per second, which is pretty high. So that 70 metres is assumed to act over three seconds. Um, maximum inflow angle doesn't particularly bother us, but it's basically a measure of the difference between the axis of rotation of the blades and the, and the airspeed. Uh, structural design lifetime. Most wind turbines are designed for 20 or 25 years. And given things like this extreme wind speed, uh, average wind speed of 11 metres per second, that's a pretty big job to design a turbine to last that long. So we already know the rotor diameter is 164 metres because that is specified up here as well. And the swept area uh, of the rotor is simply the area of the circle that just encloses the blades. Um, the electricity, the electrical system, pretty standard. The only thing I want to point out here is that this is a direct drive turbine because it's designed for offshore applications. Tower type depends on the particular application. Uh, the dimensions of the nacelle that you see here are fairly standard and the weight is very interesting. Okay, so the total weight of the nacelle is 390 tonnes. Each blade weighs 35 tonnes. Okay, so if you think of that in terms of 35 tonnes of solid petroleum, you can see the sustainability issues that I've been talking about. So the blades are 80 metres long and their maximum cord, which is the width of the blade, is 5.4 metres. I'll define the, the important terms like cord and pitch and things like that later on. Okay, so this is the sort of information that you will get every time you go to a manufacturer's website and look at a particular wind turbine. And our job in this section of the course is to first of all understand how the power curve arises 
and then understand how we use the power curve and the site-specific information to get the annual energy production. Okay, so now we're going back to some very basic theory because um, I don't have time to go through uh, anything like the full aerodynamics of wind turbines. So I'm just going to give you a very simple introduction to uh, how they operate, how they extract kinetic energy from the wind. And that leads to something that's called the betts stukowski limit for the maximum power output for a wind turbine. And that's that in itself is very important. So the way we proceed is to say uh, we have wind with a velocity of u0. Uh, we have a control volume. Uh, CV stands for control volume. Uh, that is a that is a circular cylinder. Um, the radius of the control volume can be taken to be this radius here. Or alternatively, we can assume that there is a streamline that separates the flow that goes through the blades of the wind turbine from the external flow. And that streamline is called the bounding streamline. And here we have a very simple representation of the blades. Okay. Uh, we use what's called an actuator disk. We assume that the blades are porous, but they can withstand the force acting on them. And the velocity going through the blades has a value of U1, and the velocity well downstream of the blades has a value of U infinity. And U infinity is going to be less than U naught because the turbine is extracting kinetic energy from the wind. And that means that the flow that goes through the blades has to expand because the volume flow rate within that streamline that bounds the external flow from the flow that goes through the blades must have the same volume flow rate at each of those points. So this, this down here is a statement of conservation of mass that the uh, number or the number of cubic meters per second that passes that point there has to equal the number of cubic meters per second that goes through the wind turbine rotor, and that has to equal the number of cubic meters per second in the downstream flow. And we represent the flow, the blades, by a uh, actuator disk, it's called, and that actuator disk is circumferentially uniform. And so it is a model of a wind turbine when the number of blades gets very large. And that's the simplest situation to analyze. And if we do that, the analysis is actually very straightforward. Um, we can use conservation of momentum, conservation of momentum in the direction of the wind to get the thrust is going to be equal to the mass flow rate, which is density times the volume flow rate, times the difference in velocity entering and leaving the control volume. So this is actually quite similar to the equation that I used for torque uh, in a previous lecture for the Pelton turbine. And so we can write the thrust equation as uh, mass flow rate, kilograms per second times the velocity difference. So this is really just a, a restatement of Newton's law. Okay, Newton's law for a simple um, particle or a body is force equals mass times acceleration. When you have a steady flow, and we're assuming steady flow because that makes the analysis easier, then a steady mass flow rate times a velocity change is equivalent to Newton's law or is a restatement of Newton's law. Um, we can also say the thrust is equal to the pressure difference on the actuator disk times the disk area. And I forgot to mention that capital R is the radius of the actuator disk, which is, of course, the uh, rotor radius. And then we say um, we're going to apply conservation of energy. And we're going to say this wind turbine is extracting kinetic energy from the wind. So again, here is the mass flow rate here, a factor of a half because we're dealing with kinetic energy. 
Here is the kinetic energy entering my control, the control volume. Here is the kinetic energy leaving the control volume. So that gives me the power that is absorbed by the wind. Now, as it stands, those three equations don't particularly help us because we need to be able to relate the power back to the thrust. And the way we do that is to use Bernoulli's equation. And Bernoulli's equation can be applied from this point here to a point just in front of the disc, and it can be applied immediately behind the disc to the well downstream flow here. But we cannot apply Bernoulli's equation across the disc because there is energy extracted by the disc, and so the Bernoulli constant or the head in the Bernoulli equation changes. But we can write that P1 is equal to the difference in the kinetic energy at the inlet to uh, the upstream face of the disc, and we can do that behind the disc as well. So we're assuming that all the energy is extracted at the disc, before the disc and after the disc, the flow is an ideal flow that is governed by Bernoulli's equation. It's a very, very simplistic approximation, but it is surprisingly accurate. Okay, and that allows us to relate the power to the thrust. Uh, we can, from that analysis, if you check uh, the arithmetic, it's not, it's not really mathematics, if you, if you check the arithmetic on the previous slide, you'll see that the power extracted is equal to the thrust times the velocity of the air as it goes through the blades. Very, very simple. And you can also show from those equations that that velocity is the average of the wind speed and the speed well downstream of the turbine. Okay. And then if we define a power coefficient, um, power divided by this term here, which has the units of power, we get this expression here, which is usually put in terms of this factor A. And A, which is uh, 1 minus U1 over U0, that has, an, I should have written it down, that has the name of axial induction factor. Axial because it's the flow parallel to the axis of rotation. Induction because it is a velocity that is induced by the presence of the turbine. And a factor because A is constrained to be in the range of zero to one. Okay, so we have a very simple expression for the uh, power output of this turbine in terms of the power coefficient, 4A into 1 minus A squared. And now what we do is exactly the same as what we did for the Belton turbine. We look for the conditions that give us maximum power. And of course, the only thing that can change in this expression here is A. So we differentiate our CP with respect to A, set, set it equal to zero, and we get that the maximum power coefficient is 16 over 27 when the value of A is one third. Uh, in other words, the velocity of the wind at the, at the turbine rotor is two thirds of the wind speed. And in the flow well downstream of the rotor, it is one third. Now, this result here is the most important theoretical result for wind turbines. Okay. <clears throat> it's called the Betz Tchaikovsky limit. Um, if you look at particularly Western textbooks, uh, it's called the Betz limit because Betz was not a Russian. He was, he was a German. And uh, the Germans were probably the best aerodynamicists at the turn of the 20th century. Um, but, in fact, there was some research that um, one of Ivan's colleagues did a number of years ago, some historical research, that proved that the Russian scientist Tchaikovsky also had derived the limit at the same time. So uh, we're trying to get the wind energy community to stop calling it the Betts limit and call it the betts tchaikovsky limit. The other thing is that um, uh, uh, Tchaikovsky lived in Moscow uh, for most of his life 
and his house has been turned into a museum. And if you ever get the chance to visit the Tchaikovsky Museum, I urge you to do so. It's a, it's a fascinating experience into the history of um, Russian aviation and aerodynamics. Um, I was fortunate to go there a number of years ago. So you can see me down here uh, with my hands on one of his wind turbines. So there's a small wind turbine that Tchaikovsky was involved with. Uh, there's a larger wind turbine blade behind it. And one thing that I particularly like, um, I when I introduced myself to you at the beginning of these lectures, I did not point out that most of the research work that I do is experimental. Um, I, I've built probably about seven wind tunnels in my life. And what you see here is Joukowsky's wind tunnel. This is one of the oldest wind tunnels in existence. It has been refurbished, but as far as I understand, it was built at the beginning of the 20th century. Now, Joukowsky was primarily a theoretician. Um, there's a very, very famous theorem in aerodynamics called the kutta Joukowsky theorem which is the most important theorem in aerodynamics that Joukowsky derived in 1906. So he was basically a theoretician, but he was a good enough scientist to know that in aerodynamics generally, in fluid mechanics as well, you need to do experiments. And so he built himself a wind tunnel, which is pretty amazing. So like I said, if you get a chance to go to the Joukowsky Museum, I urge you strongly to do so. It's, it's a very interesting experience. Okay, here's a little bit of homework for you. Um, the, what I've shown you here is the bottom line of the power coefficient, a half times the density of the air times the wind speed cubed times pi r squared. I am going to ask you to think about what is the physical significance of, of that term? And uh, we'll talk a little bit about it uh, again tomorrow. Okay, um, so I've told you about the power coefficient, power divided by the factor that I had on the previous page. The other very important parameter for wind turbine operation is the tip speed ratio, you see here. Usually given the symbol lambda, defined as the angular velocity of the blades times r, which we've defined already, divided by the wind speed. And um, most modern wind turbines have a tip speed ratio of about eight. So that Vestas V164 turbine that you saw the specifications for before uh, would uh, be sitting on this diagram somewhere about here. Um, there's a couple of important features about that. One is that you can see as the radius increases, uh, omega decreases for a constant tip speed ratio. And that's, a, that's the primary reason why very large wind turbines rotate so slowly. Okay, the, the tip speed ratio of wind turbines tends to be independent of the size of the wind turbine. So a small wind turbine that is, say, one metre in diameter will probably have a very similar tip speed ratio to the Vestas 164 turbine. That means, of course, that the Vestas turbine must rotate much more slowly. The reason for that equality is there's two reasons. One is the aerodynamic performance of the blade that we're going to be looking at uh, soon uh, in the next lecture because it's just about time to finish today. And the other is that uh, this uh, product here is the circumferential velocity of the blades. And that has to be kept below about 100 metres per second. Otherwise, you get compressibility effects on a wind turbine blade, and that brings noise. But if you look at any textbook on wind turbines, you'll probably see a diagram like this, which is meant to give you an indication of how turbines behave. So you can see um, 
this particular textbook doesn't have the correct name for the Betz-Tukowski limit, but that's it sitting there. Um, that limit is actually a high tip speed ratio limit, okay? Um, because at, at a tip speed ratio of zero, you can't produce power no matter how efficient your blades are because you, there's no angular velocity. So in reality, the uh, power coefficient has to increase from zero uh, to asymptote to the betz tukowski limit. Um, and there are a number of different theories for how that happens. This is, this is one of them. So this, this curve or this um, diagram is, show, is shown mainly to demonstrate one of the reasons why large wind turbines have a high tip speed ratio. It's so the difference between the actual maximum power and the betz tukowski limit is not significant. Okay, <clears throat> I'll finish up. I've only got a couple of minutes left, so I'll say a couple of things about this slide and we'll come back to this slide tomorrow. Uh, this is data that I got for uh, the Vestas V80, 80 metres diameter, two megawatt turbine. And so you can see the rated power is two megawatts. And what I forgot to show, tell you before, is that um, when the wind speed exceeds about 25 metres per second, the turbine is shut down. I'll talk some more about that tomorrow. Um, down at the bottom end, you can see the cut in wind speed that I've mentioned before. And here you can see typically between about five and 10 metres per second uh, that the power output increases rapidly with the wind speed. In fact, that uh, power dependence on wind speed is approximately cubic. Okay, the power output increases nearly as wind speed cube. And again, I'd like you to think about the reason for that. And the last thing I'll say tonight for me uh, and pick up on tomorrow is what is happening around here. This is an extremely important part of the power curve of a wind turbine. Um, it's called the shoulder of the power curve, you know, sh shoulder like so, because it is the transition from the rapidly increasing power output to a constant power output that you see here. Okay, so it's just on 8.30 p.m. my time, so 10.30 a.m. your time. So let's finish there. And tomorrow I'll come back to this slide because there's still some important features that uh, we have to talk about with this slide before we keep going with the wind power. So I'll stop there. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask them or put them in the chat. Or alternatively, you can email me. So there's not there's nothing in the chat. So uh, if there aren't any questions, we shall finish for today. Just want to ask uh, about brakes inside the mm -hmm. nestle. So brakes uh, need just for shutdown or just to control operate. Yes, yes. Um, a break is usually regarded as a, a backup device. You only use a break if all other mechanisms fail. And the main, okay. the main way that power output is controlled is by the pitch adjustment of the blades. Okay, I'll mention I'll mention that again tomorrow. But since uh, I haven't brought, uh, hold on, no, I won't. I'll, I'll get back to. I'll get back to that tomorrow, Ivan. Okay. Then we have finished for today. And again, uh, thank you for your attention and see you tomorrow.